try to count the stars You already know them each by name Every single galaxy is your design and majesty display Your glory shines before our eyes The more we see, the more we love You can't have missed it the inauguration of President Trump. Uh, now, obviously, in church, we don't do party politics, but we do care about God's world. So I think it might be good just to have a special moment of prayer for the United States. Would that be okay? Let's pray. Father God, we pray for that great nation, the United States of America. Pray for the people of the United States. We pray for the influence of America on your world, on so many countries and so many people. And we pray for America's new president. Lord God, we pray for an increase in peace in your world from the decisions of that government. We pray for an increase in justice. We pray for mercy within that justice. We pray for fairness. Lord God, most of all, we pray for each of those congressmen and senators, for all of that establishment, that there would be people there who hear from you, who seek your will for your world. We pray for good to come from the United States. Lord, we pray that your kingdom will come and your will be done. Father, we pray for ourselves this morning. We gather in your name. We gather for our love of Jesus. We gather to be drawn close to you, to be inspired for you. I pray that you will speak to us this morning, that you will Use me this morning, and Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. So, do you like my slide? I made that myself. It's a beautiful picture of the world, and Jesus for the world in red. I slightly changed the theme title, in case you're curious. And there in the middle, you can see Britain, just where she belongs, right in the center of the world. It's beautiful. I think you can revolve it, can't you? But there's, there's no point. You just leave her there. She's happy where she is. Just want to uh, uh, get us to think about something. Do you exclude people? Who do you exclude? Now, I know I'm looking out. I know hardly anyone. I'm looking good, kind, nice people who, if you said to anyone here, you've just excluded that person by virtue of their race or their religion or something, or their, you know, all those things that people exclude people for, you would change, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh, I didn't mean to. That was an accident. I don't want to exclude people. But I want to ask, do we exclude people from the good news of Jesus? Do we exclude people from the good news. Because I think sometimes, accidentally, we do. We have some preconceptions that make us exclude some people. I had some friends once who were kind of going for it Christians. They loved the Lord. They were regular at church. And they chose not to tell their children about Jesus. They, they decided that that would uh, influence them too much, and they didn't want to indoctrinate them. They wanted to let them be and let them come to a point where they make their own choice. I don't want to judge other parenting skills because I don't want anyone to judge mine. <laughs> I, I look at it and think, my children should know the truth as I know it. They should know that 
I might be wrong. They should know that I'll love them if they have different opinions to me. They should know that they, can, they have to make up their own minds for themselves. But Jesus is the truth, so I share Jesus with my children. That's an easy one. What about uh, people from other religions? We can get quite um, concerned, rightly, about offending people from other religions. We can look at people from the Jewish faith and think, well, they've probably already made their decision about the Messiah. They probably know all about the Messiah. They've, they've made their decision. We can look at people from the Muslim religion and think they, they, they are engaged already in their faith. They don't want to hear about Jesus. It would offend them if I told them about Jesus. I had a weird encounter with a guy on a British Airways flight to London. He was a Muslim, but... Uh, how do you put this? He had red hair. Kind of auburn hair. That's a bit... I'm not trying to make any uh, stereotypes there, but I was surprised he was a Muslim. And we started talking about his faith, and he was really keen to talk about his faith. And he was really interested to hear about Jesus. And we talked for ages about Jesus. I told him all about Jesus. The thing that surprised him most was when I told him that Christians believe in lifelong monogamy. He didn't know that. He thought we were all like Madonna. Do you know? All off all over the place. Uh, I don't know what... I hope that planted some seeds in him. I was actually getting a bit worried towards... Because it was a very long conversation. He he'd made it quite clear, quite loudly, so everyone could hear that he was a Muslim. And then he also kind of started talking about fatalism. Do you know, like, when your time's come, it's come, isn't it? When you die, you die. And I'm sitting on a British Airways flight just thinking, <laughs> this is an aeroplane. <laughs> We're going to get tasered by the flight marshal or something. Just settle down. But he was a very interesting guy. But he wanted to hear about Jesus. It really interested me because I might have thought, hey, it might be rude to start talking about Jesus with this person. Do we exclude some other people? What about people who we might think, maybe we don't think about it, but we might assume are kind of too, too bad. Do, do you know? Kind of people who've sinned too much. Or we think, oh, Jesus is here for my kind of sin. Do you know, that kind of sin can be forgiven, but that guy's a pedophile in prison. Do you know that kind of thing? And thinking, no, I, I, they, they don't need to hear about Jesus. Do we exclude them? What about people who have a lifestyle that is very, very obviously, happily, openly, not a Christian lifestyle? Do you know, maybe hugely promiscuous, or, you know, obviously, or maybe nakedly don't pause off the word naked. Nakedly <laughs> greedy. Do, do you know, like, I really want to be as wealthy as I possibly can be. And you can see that you think, they don't want to hear about Jesus. They're separate to this. Do we exclude those people from the good news sort of subconsciously? Do we think, no, we just need people, people who are a bit like us will want to hear the good news. People who are like them, maybe they don't. Well, for some reason like we read in this passage from Acts uh, chapter 11, the first church, the early church, the disciples, had decided to exclude a people group. And it's kind of scary, because they pretty much excluded the world, except for Israel. Except for people of Jewish heritage. They, didn't, they weren't telling them the good news of Jesus. They had decided that the Gentiles, everyone who was a, a non-Jewish person, didn't need to hear about Jesus. They were restricting the message of Jesus to people of Jewish heritage. Even though the prophecy at Jesus' birth was, my eyes have seen your salvation, that you were prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. That's what Simeon said when he met the infant Jesus. He said, salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Even though Jesus gave his disciples commands that go like this, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Is that clear? All the world, the whole creation. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's from Mark and Luke and Matthew. Look how it goes. All nations. 
the whole world, the whole creation, to the Gentiles. You think they get the point? Jesus seems to have made it really quite clear, go to the world, go to everyone. He seems to have said this to this, the disciples, but there seems to be something deep entrenched in them that makes them not see this. Maybe it's their heritage. Do you know, when Jesus was walking with them, they were in Israel. Everybody they knew was circumcised. There wasn't an opportunity to buy a bacon sandwich. Nobody was eating pork around them. Do, do you know? They lived this way. It was deep in their heritage. They were the chosen people. They were in the Holy Land. Deep in them, they know their identity. Maybe it's something a little more. I don't want to push this too hard, but perhaps they backslid a bit. Do you know? Perhaps... Pentecost happens and it's this wonderful success and thousands of people come to them and they're still worshipping the temple daily and people start treating Peter like he's a big rabbi and maybe a bit of a prophet and he's hanging around with the other big rabbis and the other prophet and maybe he's starting, thinking, well, this is how the guys in the temple behave. Maybe I should start behaving like them. This is how people who've got my stature behave. I don't know. I'm pushing that too hard. I am. But perhaps there's a bit of backsliding away from what Jesus taught. Jesus made it clear when he was with them that he was coming first to Israel. Maybe that's part of it, that Jesus several times told people, first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then also in his actions, we didn't just have these teaching, we had his actions where he went to Samaritans, he taught Samaritans, Samaritans chose to follow him. The Roman centurion asks for healing for his servant. He relates to a Gentile. He heals his servant. The Canaanite woman who comes to him and says, my daughter's dying, he does tell her about, first I'm coming to the lost house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he does heal her daughter. Jesus has demonstrated how it's going to go beyond. Jesus demonstrates what Paul later defines in, in Romans, where Paul says he came first to the Jew, then to the Greek. Greek was a word they used as a catch-all for everyone who wasn't Jewish. It, the, the implication from, from Jesus there is that Israel is like this launch pad, a launch pad to the world that God has arranged over a century, over millennia, that there will be a people who know God, a people who know his law, a people who know his promises, who hear his prophecy, who are ready for his Messiah to come. So Israel is this launch pad, Jesus comes to the launch pad, but it's supposed to shoot out across the world. But the disciples don't seem to get, that, get this, and we get this very clearly from this passage. We're actually looking at Acts 10 and Acts 11, but I figured you might start getting uncomfortable if we read that many verses all in one go. But we see in Acts 10 the way Peter treats Gentiles. Look at this. When Peter is invited into the home of a Roman centurion with his family present, the first thing he says is, you, well, it's not quite first, he says something else, but the first part of his teaching is, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. God only showed him this yesterday, the day before. So when he's saying this, he's saying, yesterday, I wouldn't have come into your house. I wouldn't have eaten with you. I wouldn't have associated with your type of person. But because of a vision, I am today. When they receive the Holy Spirit, Peter says, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So up to that point, he was thinking, ah, no Holy Spirit. These are Gentiles. Maybe if they come to me and say, I'm not baptizing you. You're a Gentile. You should be circumcised before we baptize you. You should be Jewish before we baptize you. There's an implication here of how Peter has been treating Gentiles. And the church is the same. When Peter goes back to Jerusalem and tells them what happened, what had happened with the Gentiles, they tell him off. The circumcision party, that is not a party I want to go to, they, <laughs> they criticized him, saying... You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? So the church in Jerusalem is shocked 
that they are going to these Gentiles. It looks to me pretty clear the early church has made this decision. We are going to people who follow God. We're going to Jewish people. We're not interested in the Gentiles, but God cracks it open. That's what we see in these two chapters. Four miracles. God does four separate things to crack this open, to break the preconceptions of this established church. The first miracle is the angel. Peter was telling the other disciples about the angel he saw, that Cornelius saw. The angel comes to Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He is known to be God-fearing. Usually that means that the Jewish people know that he is interested in their God. They know that he reads scripture, that he prays Jewish prayers. He's not Jewish, but he is God-fearing. He's moving towards the Jewish religion. He's known to be devout. He's thought to be good. He's a guy who gives alms. He's thought to be a good guy, this Cornelius. And an angel appears to him. And he's terrified. In terror, he says, what is it, Lord? This is a miracle. And the angel says to him, your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa to bring one Simon, who is called Peter. And he does. That's the first miracle. An angel appears to the Roman centurion. The second miracle is Peter's vision. Peter's hungry. He's sitting on his roof, as you do. They did used to do this, take in the sun. And he falls into a trance. And he sees a sheet lowered from heaven. And on the sheet, it is covered with reptiles and birds and animals, which are unclean. These are the creatures which the Old Testament says you should not be eating. Paul has never eaten these animals. He knows that he should not be eating them. They are not around in his society to eat. And a voice says, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And Peter says, what God has called clean, has made clean, oh, hang on. Peter says, no, by no means. And the voice says, what God has made clean, do not call common. Do not call defiled. The voice tells him he should eat. And Peter tries to refuse three times. And as soon as his vision is over, the men arrive to take him to Cornelius. Now this, this vision of Peter's is interesting, for, oops, is interesting for several reasons. The voice says to him, what God has made clean, do not call common. This is very similar to what Peter has already heard Jesus saying. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. The disciples had been eating with unwashed hands. They were being criticized. Jesus was being criticized for letting them do this ritually unclean thing. And he says, no, no longer. It is not what comes from outside that defiles him. It's what comes from his heart. Isn't that what makes us unclean? What comes from our heart rather than what we eat. Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean, but the disciples don't seem to have got it. This is good news for us. This is, this is why we get to eat prawns and rabbit and bacon. Because Jesus declared all foods clean, and he said it's about your heart, not about your ritual practices. The other interesting thing is, isn't it interesting that God chooses this method to talk to Peter about Gentiles? Ostensibly, the, the whole pr progression is about Gentiles. But first he talks to him about food, because the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> Not necessarily. But why does he do that? It's that the, the food laws are intricately connected with the way that they treat Gentiles, the way they understand their identity. Then the next miracle, I'm stretching a point to call this a miracle, but I think there's something of a miracle in it, is Cornelius' character. 
What a great guy. It appears that Cornelius does not previously know the gospel. He doesn't know about Jesus. But he is seeking God. Cornelius hears the angel and obeys the angel. Cornelius is a man of some stature. He's a Roman centurion. He's the occupying force. He's part of the ruling army. And he is willing to send to a Jewish guy. Not only does he send for him, when he comes, he thinks it's so special, he gets his close friends around and his family. He doesn't do this in private. You know, oh, it's a bit dodgy for me to talk to you lot because we're, we're in charge. So I'll just meet you down a dark alley somewhere. No, he has him in his house. He has his friends and his family there to see him. And as soon as Peter em- enters, Cornelius falls on his knees. And Peter says, I am just a man, just as you are a man. Cornelius is just the right guy for this moment. He is open and willing and ready. There's something of a miracle in that. And then the fourth miracle is whilst Peter is still speaking, the Holy Spirit descends on them. They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the people that Peter took with him can see this. It's not a, ooh, I think the Holy Spirit came by. It's a, we can see the Holy Spirit on you. You're praying in tongues. You are are reacting to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's a mighty miracle. And this progress of things that God makes happen is what leads Peter to share the gospel with these Gentiles. He tells them that God was preaching good news. God sent the word to be preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. So he starts with God because he knows Cornelius is a God-fearing man. God sent Jesus to bring the good news of peace. Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Lord of all. He tells him how he was a witness to Jesus' life. He was a witness to his baptism. He saw Jesus being anointed by the Holy Spirit when God spoke from heaven. He saw Jesus healing. He saw Jesus call people to witness to him. He saw Jesus' death. He saw his resurrection. He saw the risen Lord and spoke with him. He told them that the risen Jesus had commanded the apostles to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. He was told to testify that Jesus is appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And he tells him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That is Peter's message. That is our message. There is judgment. There will be judgment. There is forgiveness in Jesus' name for those who believe in him. God does expect us to change for him, to live for him. God is wanting us all and has made this easy path for us to come to him of forgiveness. So this whole process goes on. These four miracles, lots of conversation, lots of unexpected things happen, and then Peter gets it. He finally gets it. God has cracked open his heart. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. It takes all of this for him to say that. God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right, is acceptable to him. It takes a long journey for Peter to get it. He says, when he's telling the church about what happened, he says, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. Finally, Peter's remembering Jesus' teaching. It's interesting the bit he remembers. He remembers that Jesus said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says to them, if then God gave the same Spirit to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? That is a good question. Who are you to stand in God's way, Peter? So he gets it, and he tells the church that he's got it, and the church 
gets it, finally. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. The Gentiles can repent and be led to life. This is a long journey. There's a lot of verses we've just gone through. A long, long journey before the church is cracked open to realize that Jesus' message is for the world, for every single person in the world. Do you see how God works here? It is really very interesting to try and look at how God chose to work with his people. You can see how God chose to work with his church, how he chose to work with the people who he'd selected to be his church. It's not all one big flashbang wallop, there's the message. It's a process of these different miracles that happen that convince them that they have been wrong, that they need to change. He sends an angel to a non-Christian. He takes a Jew to a Gentile. He cracks open the preconceptions of the established church. We need to expect God to work like this. We have to stop putting God in a box where we tell him how he's going to work. God works in this hugely unexpected fashion. We, what I was saying at the beginning about our preconceptions about who might be open to the good news of Jesus. God can send visions to atheists. God can work miracles in the lives of anyone from anywhere. God can send angels to people. We need to expect God to teach his church like this because the church can get it wrong. We can make mistakes. We can get stuck with our preconceptions. And God can set us straight. We need to be open to this, open to God working miracles that change the heart of the church. We need to expect God to do what we think might be impossible. What is seemingly impossible is possible with God. And we can get so bogged down in our preconceptions, in our strategies, in our strategies for our life, for our church, for our faith growth, for our evangelism. Do you know how to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. God has wonderful plans that we might not see. Peter never saw this coming, did he? If you think about Peter there, he was going to merrily, happily go on doing his work with the people he thought he'd been given. Cornelius probably never saw it coming. All he knew was an angel told him to send for a person. That's what he knew. And look what happened. He's baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's become a follower of Jesus. We can assume so much. We can make all these plans and these strategies that we think is the only way we could do it, that God could work. We think, oh, God needs to do this, and God needs to do that, and then these things would happen. God has his plan, and we need to be ready for his plan, to be ready to expect the unexpected, but also to hope for the amazing, to hope for the startling. Who am I that I can stand in God's way? It's a kind of awful thought that we could stand in God's way, that we could be on the wrong side of this. We do not want to stand in God's way. We, we avoid standing in God's way by being hopeful, by being open, by desiring his will, not ours, by desiring his kingdom will come. His will will be done. So let us not give up on God. Do you know when you think, oh, I've waited 60 years and God hasn't done it. Why has this not happened? Let us not limit God. Let us not put him in a box. Let us keep praying. Let us pray for miracles. Pray for the unexpected. Let us expect him 
to work. And let us expect him to work in ways we never expected. Shall we pray together? Lord God, I pray for this lesson in faith that Peter had, that we might have this lesson, that you would crack open our faith so that we desire and expect miracles, so that our will is not formed by our own plans, but that we truly pray for your will to be done, we truly hope for your will to be done. Lord God, may we see you working like this. Breaking down the tired old ways of the church. Breaking down the places where we've got stuck in our expectations. Speaking to us. Showing us where we're wrong. Guiding us to grow your kingdom. Lord Jesus, work in us. In your name and for your glory, Lord. Amen.